As we conclude our mini-series on common issues in the healing place for now, uh, in today's episode, we talk about what happens when someone knows they need change and they come into the healing place and they start talking to one of our uh, staff or care coaches, but then they're not actually able or willing to do the hard work. We talk about the value in having responsibility, having accountability, and actually uh, not doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results because that's the definition of insanity. So we hope you enjoy our talk today. So we have a special guest with us today. Yes. Bethany. Welcome. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. So Glenna, yeah. why don't you introduce Bethany for our listeners? Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So Bethany is a student at TKU and she is, I forget what your degree's in, biblical counseling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her degree's in biblical counseling and um, she is doing her practicum and internship here at the Healing Place through the summer, gaining some hours and some experience and... Um, she's a fantastic student. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, That's thanks for kind. jumping yeah. in. Spoonie's yeah. taking a little break today, so you're feeling the Spoonie chair. <laughs> yeah. So welcome. That's, Glad that's you're good. here with us. That's so good. we're going to continue talking about some of these common issues that we see. And, you know, I think I brought up the teen stuff, and then, you know, I did the lion's share on the infidelity issue. So, uh, Ross, I was going to throw it to you today. We were talking and I said, that'd be a great one to discuss on the podcast. So yeah, let's just go ahead and set us up for, tee us up for today. Yeah. 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 I think one thing that, that I see, um, from a general sense with a lot of different issues that people come with is, uh, is, is seeing the change that needs to be made and having trouble making that change. Mm. So um, over time, even coming and bringing back the same problem, you know, trying to face it the same way and getting the same results. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, uh, it, it seems really obvious from the outside and seems like they even see that that is the thing that needs to, to happen. But oftentimes it's hard to really decide to make that change. So yeah. I see that a lot. Yeah. So I always say, I, I don't know, I guess it's a common phrase, but I don't know where I heard it first, but when the student's ready, the teacher appears, yeah. right? Um, it, so it's not necessarily about us. It's mm-hmm. it's about, is this person truly really ready for change? Mm-hmm. Or are they just wanting to come in and gripe and tell you what they need to do or mm-hmm. tell you what needs oh, to happen right. or tell you what everybody else in their world is like, wait, are you really ready to hear? Or are you just here to tell me what mm-hmm. you think is best? And mm-hmm. last I checked, your way isn't working, right? <laughs> right. Or the person that shows up and they're here because, well, they might be court ordered or <laughs> they might be the athlete that got yeah. caught smoking pot. And so they're sure. coming to counseling. And so they're not really sure if they want to change an art or maybe like their spouse or their parent yeah. or somebody has said like, man, you really need to get some counseling. And mm-hmm. so they're coming in going, okay, I'm here. Yeah, cross like, arms. Oh, for sure. Okay, I, I'm showing up for counseling, you oh, know, yeah. but they're not ready to change. They don't see what needs to be changed. Yeah. And um, so they're being encouraged to go. So they may just be showing up. So whether it's a teen or a spouse or, you know, family issues, if mm-hmm. someone is, quote, dragged kicking and screaming, it's not that effective, is it? Mm. No. Until they're ready. It's yeah. it's like, yeah. And and we sometimes feel the obligations like, ugh. And a matter of fact, if you start to dread that appointment, if you're mm. thinking, man, it's like pulling teeth. Well, maybe that's time for maybe a handoff or a talk with mm. the person who dragged them in. <laughs> right. right. And sometimes it's just a matter of like, okay, let's build some rapport. Mm. Let's see if we can build some trust here. Let's see what we can ask some really great Socratic questions that Mm -hmm. open up their mind to seeing like something. And sometimes it's like, okay, well, let's talk about the people who made you come. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what got you in the situation that somebody's saying you need to be here and just asking them like, how's that affecting your life socially? How is that affecting your life at your job? How is that affecting your life with your relationships and really building that rapport, hopefully 
and sometimes they go to that spot where they're like, oh man, maybe I do need to be here. Yeah. And sometimes they don't. I, yeah. You're really gifted at that. And I hear this, uh, this is really a compliment to what we do. I hear that, that people, what they thought it was going to be like, mm-hmm. and they may have had bad experiences at other counselors or other therapy, quote unquote, sessions. And they come in kind of expecting this or not knowing what to expect. And they think, wow. That guy was normal, man. She was really friendly, and the, you're really non-judgmental. gifted, non-judgmental. You normalize things, and so they don't feel the anxiety, they don't feel crazy, and they're mm-hmm. they're more open. Mm-hmm. So developing that rapport is very, very, very important. Yes. Right. So, what are some things that you see, Ross? Why do you think so? The person wasn't drag kicking and screaming. They mm-hmm. know their way isn't working. Mm-hmm. They come in, they need help. Why do you see that blocks them from actually doing the work? Yeah, I mean, I think. You know, referring back to our last podcast, that um, the the weight of the cross is comes with a lot of mm. death, which death is painful. It's uncomfortable. It's that we're afraid. You know, like we don't want to get to that place. So I think that uh, that that people um, are are afraid of what the other side of that decision holds, or what the other side of that change looks like, mm-hmm. and if they're going to be able to do it. Right. If they're oh, going to be absolutely. able to, to survive, you know, if, if they need to end something, if the pain on the other side of that's going to be too great for them. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, if they are in a, um, a negative behavioral cycle, like what, how, how, what's going to be their coping mechanism on the other side? And are, are they going to have the strength? You know, mm-hmm. I think that's a lot of it too. Like, am I going to have the strength to, 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 um, really enact the change and be disciplined enough with not going back because going back has been so painful for me and for my family. I've tried to change so many times I haven't been able to. Right. And so like me trying again, is, is, is the change really going to stick? Right. Um, right. So a lot of, a lot of those, those places that I understand their fear yeah. and their, and their pain and their struggle, um, yeah, so it's a challenge. They've wow, been through they're... January 1st, uh, New Year's resolution, and then at January 15th, they've fallen back, and yeah. so they think that's going to be the deal. Yeah. But mm-hmm. many times they haven't tried to come in and have new ideas right. and have accountability mm-hmm. from, from a counselor. That's right. 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 right? Or a coach. Right. Um, I think they think sometimes like, oh, I'm the exception. Like it won't work yes, for, for me. me. Mm-hmm. It's not going to work for me, and I think that goes back to some core shame and fear. And to speak to what you're talking about, that fear, a lot of times an analogy I share with my clients is like, you know how you see the trapeze artist swinging, right? And so like they're here and they're like, I know I need to let go of this bar to catch this bar over here. But it's terrifying to just let go of that bar. And it's this in between when you're grabbing for that new bar and like going, are they going to catch me? Is there a net? It's terrifying. And so just encouraging them like, you can do this. You yeah. can let go of the old and you can grab the new. Yeah. That's yeah. perfect analogy. So when, <laughs> when people come in, there's this, I heard it with lifeguard training mm-hmm. that, uh, I was just talking to a lifeguard over the weekend and, and she said that it's a good thing at first, if a person doesn't swim for them to be flailing around, cause then you can see, you them, see them and they're, they're up on the top. They're not, right. they're not sinking like a rock, but then when you go as a lifeguard, when you go and grab them, it's like, okay, you need to quit. You need to quit flailing or you're going to take us both down. Gotcha. Yeah. Like yeah. we have to wait until they've expended all their energy and then pull them to safety or mm-hmm. they will take you down with them. Exactly. And so a lot of times people come in flailing and they start to take us down because they're continuing their way, mm-hmm. right? It's like if I go to a golf course and I've been hitting a slice and I keep a hundred times swinging with that same, you know, outside to in swing plane, right? Uh, it's going to keep slicing. If my hold my grip the same, do the swing, it's going to happen over and over and over. And that's why people feel defeated. It's like, okay, maybe you need a coach to look at your grip. Maybe mm-hmm. we need to take a video of your swing plane and see, oh, maybe take the club inside to out and you start hitting the ball straight. Yeah. Or even, <clears throat> even if we continue that analogy, like, uh, you know, you may be thinking, oh, I just need to, 
I need to move the ball here, or move the ball there or whatever. And it could be an imbalance in your hips or something that's causing you to swing that way. Yeah. And every, you know, they keep wanting to change this one thing. And this is the thing that needs to change. And I know that this is the thing that needs yeah. to change. It's like, well, if you would t take a step back and evaluate some of these other things, then there could be more significant change that happens in the long term. But that's going to be slower. It's going to take more work. It's yeah. going to be more uncomfortable. It may mean you have to step away from golf for a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. to get that strength built up. And those things are the scary things. Well, and I love what you said. It may take an outside person being able to evaluate, mm -hmm. to give good feedback and to mirror and to say, like, this is what I'm seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to correct this and see what happens? Yeah. 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 And sometimes with that rapport, you have the permission to add, hey, can I tell you what I'm seeing here? Or can mm -hmm. I, can I ask a question or can I give you this suggestion? You know, sometimes just a, a well-placed question by right. somebody that they trust. They go, Oh, I've never thought of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the value. You know, we talked about you, you interviewed me once upon a mm -hmm. time about why I love doing what I do. Um, yeah. That's the value of coming in and, and seeing someone because sometimes what we think it's, this person has a blind spot. It just seems obvious to me. I just look at it. I just say something that's not profound at all, but they go, I've never thought of that. Right. Mm -hmm. You, and, and so that's one of my favorite things to do is to talk to people and give them some insight that didn't seem like it was that life, you know, uh, uh profound or earth shattering, but it really made a difference. Mm -hmm. So tell me your experience with that. I mean, with it, anything that we're talking about kind of strike a chord with you so far. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I think the main thing someone once asked me, like, why would I, they said, I know what my problem is. Like, why would I go to counseling? Like, I know what needs to be fixed. Yeah. And I said, yeah. well, yeah, but like, are you currently fixing that? And they're like, well, no. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah like, you probably exactly. need some help. And I said, also, there's things that I just would never see. I said, there's insights mm -hmm. I've, I've gained because I've been in counseling before that I would never would have gained unless I like went to counseling first. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And there's such a stigma on it. The, the, mm. the, the shame. Yeah. Like, is there something wrong with me? And, and people say, well, I don't, do I need counseling? I'm like, you tell me, yeah. you know, I, you tell me yeah. it's, but that, is there something wrong with me? It's like, uh, last night I was talking to my son about relationship counseling and he's heard me say it over and over that it should be instead of, oh no, Ooh, did you hear they're in counseling? Mm -hmm. It should be. Yeah, it's every 3,000 miles oil change. It, mm -hmm. It's time for maintenance. It's time for this to couple to go in and talk about the relationship. Yeah. It's only going to help. It's mm -hmm. not going to get worse, right? Yeah, and some people think it's like too small of an issue or something too. Mm -hmm. right. They're like, well, yeah, but I'm like not on like drugs or I didn't like crash my parents' car and have a crazy rebellious childhood or whatever. Or whatever. Right, and I'm like, right. why Why would you want it to get to that far? Yes. Well, how about know. we stop it before it gets yeah, to exactly. that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's really so good. good. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Well, and that you were saying something about like waiting, why people wait with couples, couples typically wait five to seven years before yeah, they I've seek help. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Five to seven years. And so even and like for about, us as individuals, mm -hmm. how long do we wait before we invite somebody in to help? Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And I just think about the, if you, you know, if you've been swinging, how many bad scores and bad days on the golf course if I waited five to seven years to get my swing corrected, yeah. how many, we know what can happen in a marriage in five to seven years. Oh yeah. How many dark nights of the soul and sleepless nights and knock down, drag out fights and bad modeling for your children, you know, and reinforce bad patterns have you had in five to seven years? Mm -hmm. So go, uh, you know, how can we take as, as, as much as we talk about, you know, it's okay not to be okay and mm -hmm. come as you are and welcome home at Cross Timbers. How do we take the stigma off of counseling? How, what, what, what can we do? What is, what is something, may, maybe even Bethany, you could have a look at this, just being, you know, um, just from an outsider's perspective. What do you think churches can do to take the stigma uh, off, of, of, off of counseling? The idea to go to get help for our mental health or our relationship issues. Anything that we haven't already thought of? Um... I don't know. I think it's helpful that like, because some people think like, I don't know, I guess sometimes past, like maybe the education between the difference between like a pastor and a counselor maybe would help. Because some people are like, I'm, I'm not saying don't go to a pastor or pastoral counseling too, but like 
people are like, oh, I want to, you know, they go to a giant church and they're like, oh, yeah, I want to see a pastor. And I'm like, well, do you have a relationship with any of them? Or, you know, and like they don't even know anyone. So it's like if you're going to see a stranger anyway, a strange pastor, it's like wouldn't you want to see like a counselor or okay. a pastoral counselor who's actually going to like walk through it with you? Yes. Yeah, and a lot of people will say like, oh, yeah, like I went to a pastor and it's helpful and they prayed for me. And I'm like, yes, please always do that. But like sometimes it's like, yeah, but you need someone to keep with you not just the one prayer the one time which so, that's their heart is to good. walk with so you're people. getting into different it's it's funny so yeah. i actually talked to uh, a nice lady with the denton record chronicle over the weekend um and she was asking us about what we do and mm-hmm. did we see an uptick in our intake over the pandemic and um absolutely we did and she was just talking about what we do and 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 one of the things i highlighted was the fact that you know, a, there's a lot of different needs out there and there's a lot of different modes of treatment for, for those people. Yeah. So we, one of the hugest things in our training is when to refer and when to report. Mm-hmm. So if you come in to see a pastor, you know, who's mm-hmm. going to give you biblical wisdom and advice and guidance and, 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 uh, uh biblical counsel, uh, yeah. prayer, right. And walk alongside you and encourage you. But does that person who's an addict, does he need to be in, in rehab? Does he need to go to yeah. an alcohol or a drug treatment center? Mm-hmm. Does the person who's depressed need to maybe maybe do some CBT, so, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy with a yeah. therapist? Does, does the person who's struggling with anxiety need to see a licensed clinician? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe so, right? And so we all the time... Uh, will refer people to different levels of care, right? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. to your point, but we can always walk alongside and co co labor with with mm-hmm. those people in their issues, you yeah. know. And yeah. the thing that we're learning in our mental health coach training, uh, certification training, is that the first place people look is usually clergy. Mm-hmm. Right. And of course, then there's that huge gap between doing nothing and then going to pay $175 an hour. Right. Mm-hmm. right. And hopefully yeah. we can fill, we can fill that gap. Yeah. People think that's the only option. They're like, yeah. oh, I have to see like a psychiatrist. And I'm like, right. whoa, <laughs> right. do you right. though? Like, yeah. and they're like, or the pastor. And I'm like, well, there's something. To yeah. Hopefully yeah. there's yeah. something in the middle. I don't know. <laughs> right. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. I mean, yeah. I do think that there's a cultural impact and a cultural influence on mental health care in general, that that we're moving in the right direction towards people being more open to it. Uh, but especially in the church culture, you know, it, we've talked about this before, but it's, it's the idea that, you know, you need to have more faith or you need to pray about it more right. or, you know, you, because you're a Christian, you shouldn't be feeling that. You shouldn't be feeling depressed. You know, the joy of the Lord should be your strength. All of these mm-hmm. things that happen. And I, I do think that um, we're lucky to be serving in a place at Cross Timbers where our mental health is, you know, put in front of us and people are open and vulnerable about how they struggle from the stage, which helps other people feel open to be able to talk through that. Um, but I do think that, that we are, the, the tide is turning, you know, the proverbial tide is moving towards people being more open to not having that stigma around yeah. mental health care That's good. and uh, and getting help with issues. Yeah. The, so I think about the woman at the well. Um, so, so to your last, you, you the joy of the Lord is mm-hmm. my strength and you should have more faith. One of the things I hear, you know, Jesus is the answer. Okay. You need Jesus. It, exactly. Right. But what does that mean? Mm-hmm. So if Jesus is the answer, you know, okay. So, and that's what's so nebulous for people. It's this ambiguous statement, you know, mm-hmm. Jesus is the answer. And so they, they asked Jesus in their heart. They said a prayer. They got baptized. They invited Jesus to be their forever friend. They, so Jesus, and, and again, not to put any of that down as I'm saying that, but so now what? What does that mean? And so with Jesus, I, I think about if Jesus is the answer, that the woman at the well, right, if you go read that story, I believe this was Jesus sitting down doing a counseling session with a woman who quite, uh, I would say, probably had a father wound, had had a distant or, or absentee father who never poured into her. So she didn't know any, she had any value or worth. And Jesus is saying, now, tell me about your latest man. So it's like, what is it, five or six? The one you're with now is not your husband. He knew she's looking for validation from men. 
and you keep making that mistake. If you, if you knew who I was, if you could allow me to tell you, if you knew, I, I know who you are. I know the value and worth you have. Let me give you living water that never runs out. Let me fix your identity so that you don't have to get validation from the next man who looks your way, right? And causes you to be vulnerable to promiscuity or to, you know, adultery or what have you. Let me, let me heal your identity. So my point is, this was not just some baptism or prayer. This was, okay, so if Jesus is the answer, what does Jesus with skin on look like? Mm -hmm. When Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm going to live in you and my spirit and you're going to do greater things than me, I think it's getting to know people, building rapport. Let me talk to you about what's going on. Right. That's good. Yeah. So good. And I love that story because yeah, Jesus ministered to her and I love it's the giving hope and receiving hope and giving, and giving hope. hope. So she goes back she to goes the back. town and she tells these people, Hey, there's this guy and he told me all these wonderful things about me and about him being the Christ. And so the townspeople came out and they spent what, three days with him? And in the end of that scripture it says we went there because we believed you for what you said, but our lives are transformed because of what he has said to us. Yes. And so he did. He spoke that that yeah. living water into them, but it mm -hmm. was through relationship. Think about, think yes, and think about the people who've come to you mm -hmm. and they feel tons of shame about being with five or six guys. And you went to the fact that they never had a father. Mm-hmm. And your heart broke with them and you normalized that and you didn't judge and that you took away the shame and you said, of course you acted. That's the way someone was going to act. You were malfunctioning mm -hmm. correctly. <laughs> that's what happens when you don't that. have the, the right input. So let me tell you about somebody who loves you. Let me give you a, 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 another father, right? Who's adopted you and will pour that into you. And then she's like, oh my gosh, this guy didn't judge me. I, I feel different. I feel you know, literally life transformed. She goes and refers her friend. All of a sudden her friend shows up on your calendar. Right. Mm -hmm. And because it's like, wow, go. And it, I believe this is us being Jesus. Mm -hmm. I truly do. Mm -hmm. And again, this is what lights me up is when somebody gets hope for the first time that they're not going to continue to medicate or be addicted in the way to mask that pain because we've helped them get to the root of it mm -hmm. and their life has changed. That that's is good. Jesus, right? Changing their life. Good stuff. Woo! That. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man. So, are we going to be done early today? Let's do it. That's really good. <laughs> that's <laughs> really, really good. So, so let, me, let me do this, though. There are a lot of people who will never take that step. And I always wanted to make this kind of... So, to the person who's struggling whether it be anxiety, depression, they've literally considered suicide, um, or they wonder what it would be like to get to the point mm -hmm. to consider suicide. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've got something in their life that they know is not working and they need help. So again, let me just hear what you would say to that person to get them out of their house and, or or in their house on a Zoom call. So what would you tell them? <laughs> Man, just do it. Like mm -hmm. reach out to, like if you're a woman and you have kids that you're taking care of, like make the time. Set it a priority. Commit to three visits. If you can commit to three visits. And sometimes what I tell people, I'm like, if we don't have the connection, like let me help you find somebody you can connect with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But take that step. And so whether we're the answer for you or somebody else says, we will walk with you through it. Good. But find the babysitter, get the support, talk to a friend about it, get some encouragement, and make the call. That's good. Yeah. And so, so Ross, you alluded to it earlier, but what I love is, and I heard this on some, it was about nutrition and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, primarily diet, also exercise, but they talked about when someone's going to give up something, like... They want to lose 40 pounds and they, they're going to give up donuts or Coke, right? Sugar. They know, all they know is what it's going to feel like to not eat that donut. Mm. They don't know. They know the negative, like, oh, you're going to take away my donuts. But they don't know because they've never done it. What being down 40 pounds and not having that sugar, you know, crash in the afternoon. They don't know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. They don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And so we have to help people see a vision for something that they've never experienced, mm -hmm. right? That's good. 
And so that's why it's good to go talk to somebody who maybe has seen the the people who lose the 40 pounds and who aren't eating the donuts and drinking the Coke, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Be in that community. Go give, mm-hmm. go. It's like give, expend all your energy, quit flailing, and go in and say, okay, I want to listen. I really need help, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's amazing on the other side. So good. All right, guys. Good. Enjoy being with you. Thank you, Bethany. You're yeah, welcome. thanks, Bethany. Yeah. Really added a lot thanks today. I appreciate me. it. You're welcome. Okay. See you guys next time. So I hope you've enjoyed our conversations. Remember to like, share, follow, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And if you ever want to talk to someone in the healing place, we're here for you. Please pick up the phone and call, email, or find us on crosstimberschurch.org, The Healing Place, or find us on our Facebook page, The Healing Place Group.